ago. I remember so clearly what it was like when I graduated high school. I went to Laguna Hills High School, home of the Hawks, alma mater from down there. And after I graduated from high school, God provided a way for me to go where I wanted to go. I got to go to this place called the Master's College at that time. It is now the Master's University, which even some of our graduating seniors are going to be going there in the fall. And I am... I'm an alma mater of that place. I'm an alumni of that place. And uh, here's actually a picture of me in my dorm room when I was at Masters. Oh, yep, yeah, that one right there. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like my model shot. They asked me, to take a, asked me to take a picture of the dorm rooms to put it on. No, I'm just kidding. That was uh, me hanging out with my friends before we were going to go serve at Awana at the church that we were going to at that time. And I loved my time at Masters. I was there for three and a half years before I graduated. And I remember at the end of those three and a half years learning that there was something I had to do in order to graduate and finish college that I did not know about leading up till that time. At the end of my last semester, I was told that there is this thing I have to do called the senior comp exam. And I was unaware of this. I didn't know what that was. And basically, the senior comp exam, there's two parts to the senior comp exam. You go into this room with other seniors from your same degree and major, and you have to take a comprehensive final that is a sampling of all of the things that you learned during your time at the college. And so when I heard about this, I was like, yo, I got to study hard. I could be asked questions for my freshman year all the way up until my last year. That's going to be crazy. But honestly, that part of the senior comp exam, I was like, I feel okay about that. I think I'm going to do all right. Because I loved studying the Bible. There was another part to it that I was terrified of. Because after we were done with the comprehensive exam, we had to go into the chair of the department's office which was a guy at that time named Dr. Halstead, who was the head of the Bible department. We had to go into his office, and he could ask us any Bible question from anything that we learned during our time at Master's, and we had to get it correct right there on the spot. And that freaked me out. The thought of standing before this professor, who was honestly an awesome guy. He was one of my favorite professors He was super old. He had gray hair. He was bald on the top, a beard, a really gnarly lazy eye, so you never really knew which eye to look at when you were talking to him. But he was a super nice guy. He loved my wife. Even when I graduated, my wife had already been graduated for two years, and she was there because we were just about to get engaged. And uh, when I graduated, I had just walked. I was in full-on cap and gown. Haley was there. We were taking pictures, and Dr. Halstead walks up, and he doesn't even say anything to me. He sees Haley, and he goes, Haley! And I'm standing there. I'm like, dude, I just graduated. Like, nothing? You're more excited to see Haley? And yes, he was. I just remember at that time the thought of standing before one man who has the authority to pretty much decide whether I graduate from college or don't, and he's going to ask me any question. That feeling of, I'm going to be evaluated by you, and there is a lot writing on this right now, was a feeling of fear that I remember very clearly. See, that feeling of fear with the thought of being evaluated is something that every single person here tonight will experience. And the reason why every single person here tonight will experience that feeling of fear because of the thought of evaluation standing before one person who has a very important authority is because we're all going to be judged by Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about here tonight from the Bible. Will you open up your Bible with me to Matthew 25? And if you don't have a Bible here tonight, you could just go ahead and raise your hand right now. And my friend Jacob Upton, he'll come around and he'll give you a Bible. But we want everybody to open up a Bible to Matthew 25. So if you don't have one, raise your hand because you got to see what this is going to say with your own eyes. These are not my words. We didn't come here tonight to hear what I have to say. I definitely didn't show up here tonight wanting to tell you that you're going to be judged. No, we're in a study through the Gospel of Matthew. Over the past month, we've been working our way through Matthew 24 and now 25. And here tonight, we're just going to study the next passage. 
And Matthew 24 and 25, these two chapters are actually one sermon that Jesus gave while he was talking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. It's often been referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And the theme of this sermon that Jesus is giving right here in these two chapters is it's very clear he is coming back. And in this sermon, he's been talking about a lot. He's been talking about when is that happening? Do we know when that's going to happen? What is that going to be like? Well, tonight, he's getting to the end of it. And he wants to say something to you that you need to hear. Matthew 25, follow along as I read the passage, beginning in verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say, as he's seated on his throne with the nations gathered before him, to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we did not minister to you? Then he will answer them. He will say this, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these your brothers, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And here's a passage that's describing a very real scenario. It hasn't happened yet. It's coming someday in the future. We don't know when it's going to happen because no one knows the day or the hour when Jesus is coming back. But it's describing a time in the future where when Jesus comes, he's going to be seated on a throne and he is going to judge now, there are two times of judgment the Bible talks about. The first one is called the Bema Seat Judgment. And that's described for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, which says, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now that's talking specifically about Christians. That's talking about a time of judgment that Christians will experience where Jesus is seated on a throne. It's called the Bema Seat Judgment. And the reason why it's called the Bema Seat Judgment is because the Greek word for judgment seat here in this passage and also in Romans 14 is the Greek word Bema. And so we call it the Bema Seat Judgment. I don't know if you know this, but even Christians will be judged by Jesus. Now, when Christians get judged by Jesus, this is not a time of judgment for eternal life or eternal damnation. No, if you are a Christian, if you've been saved by God through faith in Jesus Christ, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this is a judgment not for eternal life or eternal death. This is a judgment for eternal rewards. That's what this is. The idea of a bema seat was actually something they adopted in competition at that time where a judge or a game master would sit on a seat on a platform elevated while all of the games were going on and the the seat was called the bema seat and he would watch all of the athletes competing in the competition to see if they were performing according to the rules and if they were performing according to the rules but then at the end of the race he would reward those people and if they did not perform according to the rules he would not he would not reward those people. That's what this is talking about. 
Even as a Christian, you will be judged by Jesus when you die or when he comes, and it will be a judgment of, are you going to be rewarded for the way that you lived in this life, whether faithful or unfaithful? But there's another time of judgment the Bible talks about. It's called the great white throne judgment. And it's described for us in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, which says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the great white throne judgment. And this is going to happen, according to Revelation 20, at the end of the millennium, before the eternal state, the final consummation of heaven and hell. And this is specifically going to be for unbelievers. This is specifically going to be to see, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life by the blood that Jesus spilled? And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life on that day when you stand before Jesus as he's seated on his great white throne, well then you will be damned and you'll be thrown into the lake of fire with the devil and his demons and who it was prepared for. Here's what you have to understand as you sit here tonight. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, you will be judged by Jesus. Everyone will be judged by Jesus. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 14, verses 10 through 11. We'll throw it up here on the screen. It says, For we must all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then... Each of us will give an account of himself to God. Write this down for point number one here tonight. It's going to be really simple. I just got three things that I want you to write down, and they're going to be simple. And the first thing that I want you to write down is that you will be judged by Jesus. You will be judged by Jesus. Now, some of you guys here tonight, you might be familiar with this idea. Some of you here tonight, you might be skeptical about this idea. You might hear that you will be judged by Jesus, and you might think, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. Okay, I hear these verses that you're reading for us in the Bible, but I don't know. Am I really going to be judged by Jesus? How can I know that? Should I know that? Why would I even believe something like that? Let me show you here tonight why you must believe this. Let me show you here tonight why you can fact check this as truth. Let's all go in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Everybody turn with me to Revelation chapter 1 and let me show you the reason why you can, you should, and you must believe here tonight that you will be judged by Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, look at what it says in verse 12. This is John, he gets a vision of Jesus in all of his resurrected glory as he is in heaven right now. And it says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters." In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, this is John, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he's the apostle that it says Jesus loved. He had a close relationship with Jesus. And even when he sees Jesus in all of his glory, what does he do? He falls down as if he's dead because he's overwhelmed by what he sees. And then it says this in verse 17, but Jesus laid his right hand on me, John says, saying, fear not. Here's what Jesus says. Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. What Jesus says right here in this passage is that he is the one who holds the keys of death 
and Hades. He is the one who holds the keys, making it very clear he's the one ultimately in control, the final say on where you go when you die. So when you sat down, you might have noticed you've got a key on your chair. And you might have been thinking to yourself, why are there keys on all of the chairs? Well, this is a gift from us to you. It doesn't unlock anything. It's not a real key. You can see it's a blank key. But I want you to get that key in your hand. I want you to feel it. I want you to get the picture. You know what a key does. Some of you have keys. Some of you have car keys. Some of you have keys to your home. This key, it unlocks things. It opens doors. It shuts doors. If it shuts a door and then locks it, no one can get in. Here's what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1. He says this, I've got the keys. Jesus says, yeah, death in Hades? Let's imagine there's a gate. Let's imagine there's a door, he even says in John 10. A door that opens up to heaven. A door that when it shuts, sends people to hell. And he's the one who has the keys He's the one who can either open the door and let you in, or he's the one who can close the door, lock it, and send you away. And the reason why he says he holds the keys is because, and this is what you have to see here tonight, he says, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. You can know here tonight that you will be judged by Jesus, and you want to know why? Because he rose from the grave. He died on the cross, and then three days later, he resurrected. And because he overcame death in his resurrection, his Father in heaven, God, the creator of the heavens and earth, has given him, has entrusted to him the authority and the power to be the key holder and the final say on where you go when you die. The resurrection is the reason why you can, should, and must believe that you will be judged by Jesus. If Jesus rose from the grave, then that is the compelling reason why you can know and should believe that you will be judged by him. So did Jesus really rise from the grave? Did he die on the cross for your sins and then three days later rise from the dead? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in your Bible. I want everybody to turn there with me, and I want you to see what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And start with me in verse 1 when you get there, because it says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm about to tell you guys the gospel. I'm about to tell you, and what that word gospel even means, means is good news. And he says, you have to know the gospel because the gospel is what saves you. So he's about to define for us the gospel. And he tells us before he even gives us a definition of what the gospel is, he says, the gospel is what saves you. So if you want to be saved and know that you're going to heaven when you get judged by Jesus, well, let's just even start here. Do you know the gospel? Because he defines it right here in verse 3. Here's what the gospel is. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then this is the definition of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Okay, so here is the gospel. Here is the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior that God gave so that way you can be saved. And what did he do? When he came as the Christ, he died on the cross for your sins. And then three days later, he was raised from the dead. He rose again. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Jesus died for you. And he rose on the third day. You have to know that because that is what saves you if you want to be saved. Okay, well, let's think about this. How do you actually know Jesus rose from the dead? How do we know that this is not just like any religious textbook out there claiming things about some deity? How do we know that this actually happened? How can we fact check it? How can we verify it? How can we get proof that this is historical facts? Well, look at what it goes on to say in verse 5. It says in verse 5, and after he rose, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 
Then it says in verse 6, he appeared after his resurrection to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Here's what Paul's saying. Hey, Jesus rose on the third day, and here's how you can know what actually happened. Because after he rose, he went around and he started appearing to people. And it says he appeared first to Cephas, which is talking about Peter. Then it says he appeared to the 12, which is talking about the 12 disciples. Then he even says in verse 6 that after he rose from the grave, he appeared to 500 eyewitnesses at one time. So you want to know why you can know that Jesus Christ really did rise from the grave? Because there are eyewitnesses that saw him die and then three days later saw him after he rose. Now, you might not be convinced because you might think, okay, well, they could have just said that they saw him. How do we actually know they saw him? Well, Paul said something very important in verse 6. He said, most of whom are still alive. And you want to know what his point is there? Hey, they're still alive. If you don't believe me, go ask them for yourself. And here's what you have to understand here tonight. These guys who claim to have seen Jesus rise from the grave, their lives were so changed that they went and told everyone everybody about Jesus. These guys, most of whom the night that Jesus was arrested in the garden, ran for their lives because they were afraid they were going to die too. They didn't want to be associated with Jesus, so they literally betrayed him by running away. Those guys were the same men that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. And after he appeared to them, they went around and they told everybody you need to believe in Jesus because he died on the cross for your sins and he rose three days later and I saw him after he rose. Now, that might be nice. What if they're claiming that they saw him? How do we know they actually saw him? Because no one will die for what they know is a lie. And these men were killed for their belief. Now, don't misunderstand me. A lot of people are willing to die for something that's a lie if they don't know it's a lie. There are a lot of people who believe in other religions that are willing to die for their religion, even if their religion isn't true. But you want to know why? Because they don't know that it's not true. They're sincere in their belief. Here's the difference though. These men actually saw Jesus. So if they were making it up and this was just some big scam, when it came to it, when Herod had the knife to James's throat, saying renounce Christ or die? What happened? He was beheaded. When Peter was on trial, saying renounce Christ or die? What happened? He requested to be crucified upside down because he did not think he was even worthy to be crucified right side up like his risen Lord. Here are men who saw Jesus rise from the grave, most of whom at this time were still alive. Go ask him for yourself if you don't believe it. And they ended up dying for what they knew to be true. Jesus really rose from the grave. And if he really rose from the grave, which he did, someday you will be judged by him. You have to believe it. Go back with me to Matthew 25, and I want you to understand here tonight, like let me be very clear, what I'm trying to do with every single one of you is I'm trying to shake you out of complacency. That's what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do here tonight is I'm trying to lay a foundation to help you see that you will be judged, so that way when we talk about what that judgment will be like, if you realize that the destination you're headed to is not where you want to go, you will not leave here tonight feeling like that's okay, like I, cannot, I, like I can put that off, I don't need to do anything about that. No, I'm trying to show you here, I'm trying to convince you here tonight, this is so real, it's actually going to happen, that you need to evaluate what's going to happen when I'm judged by Jesus, so that you'll know, and if what you find out, you're like, man, I I don't want that to happen to me, you'll be so convinced that you'll feel like, man, something needs to change in my life, and it needs to change tonight. Look at Matthew 25, look at verse 31, because here's what's going to happen on that day of judgment. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left and the king will say to those on his right, to the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You want to know what that is? 
That is a beautiful description of those who will be with Jesus in heaven forever. He says that heaven is like this kingdom. It was prepared by the Father for you before even the foundation of the world. That's one option on this day of judgment. You get to go to heaven, a beautiful kingdom. Here's option number two. Look down at verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. And you want to know what that is? That's a terrible description of hell. You get a beautiful picture of heaven. You get a terrible description of hell. And this is point number two I want you to write down. I told you it was going to be simple, but write it down like this. You will be judged to heaven or hell. These are the options. You will be judged by Jesus, and you will be judged to heaven or hell. The Bible makes it so clear. There is no such thing as purgatory. There's no in-between. There's no place you go where you can pay off some of your remaining sins. The Bible makes it so clear. There is no such thing as when you die, it's just over. It's lights out. There's no other option. No, the Bible makes it very clear. This was Jesus's message. There are two options, heaven or hell, and someday you will be judged by him to one or the other. Heaven, it's this beautiful place. It's a kingdom. The Father has prepared it for his people before the foundation of the world. Hell, it's a terrible place, an eternal fire for the devil and his angels, and many people, according to Jesus, will go there for all of eternity. This was Jesus' message. And you want to know what I've found as a high school director working with high school students, hundreds of them over the past 10 years? This is not only Jesus' message, this is the message that high schoolers need to hear. High schoolers need to hear about a Jesus who is a just judge, who someday you will stand before, and he will either judge you to heaven or hell. And you want to know why high schoolers need to hear about this? Because if I just offer Jesus to you and that, yeah, he came to save you by dying on the cross for your sins and rising from the grave to give you a better life, you know what high schoolers today think? I don't know. I don't think I need that. I feel like my life's going pretty well right now. If I came to you and I offered you a Jesus who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the grave three days later because you're lonely and he doesn't want you to be lonely and so he came to save you from loneliness. A lot of high schoolers are thinking, yeah, I I feel lonely, but I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'm going to make it. I don't think that I need Jesus. You need to understand here tonight that Jesus, when he came to save you, Jesus didn't come to save you from loneliness. Jesus didn't come to save you just from anxiety. Jesus didn't come to save you just so that way you could have a little bit of a better life. When Jesus came to save you, he came to save you from hell because of your sin. And when Jesus saves you, he fills you up and promises to be with you forever and ever and you'll no longer be lonely. And, if, and when he saves you, he promises to fill you up and give you real satisfaction so you don't need to keep on looking to the broken cisterns of this world. But if I'm presenting to you a Jesus tonight that came to save you, you've got to understand the reason why you need saving is not just because this world isn't that good and you want something better. The reason why you need saving is because we're all sinners and we all deserve hell and Jesus came to save you from hell from your sin. That's why he came to save you. And you desperately need that. You need that more than you need a solution to your loneliness. You need that more than you need a solution to your anxiety. You need salvation from your sins. You need someone who can set you free from hell. Because hell is going to be a terrible place that many people are going to go to. The Bible describes hell in Luke 16, as a place of torment. Have you ever been in a situation before as a high schooler where you would describe it as torment? Like, you feel like you're being tortured? There's a story in Luke 16 where a man who is rich lived a nice life. He died and he went to hell. And while he's there in hell, he says, I am in torment. He 
says when he's there in hell that he's in a place of eternal anguish. It's, it's never stopping. It never ceases. It never, ever ends. And many people are going there. That's the reality, that we all deserve it because we've all sinned. And the good news here tonight that you can know is that Jesus came to accomplish what was needed so that way you can be saved from your sin. Go with me to John chapter 3. Everybody turn with me to John chapter 3, and I need you to see the good news here tonight that Jesus came to save you from your sin so that way on the day of judgment, when you stand before him on his throne, you can know that you will not go to hell, but you will be welcomed in to the kingdom that the Father has prepared for his children. Look at John chapter 3, and let's start in verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the gospel. This is the good news that God, who is just, loved you, and he loved you in a very clear, specific way. He gave his only son, and Jesus is his son, and he died on the cross for your sins to take your place. He rose from the grave three days later, so that way if you believe in him and trust in what he did for you, you will not perish and be sent to hell, but you can have everlasting life. That's the good news. The good news is, is that even though you will be judged, no matter who you are, every one of you will be judged. You don't have to fear being judged to hell. You can know you have eternal life if you've believed in Jesus. Well, look at what it goes on to say in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So what this is saying is it's very clear here tonight, hey, look at your life. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you truly trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins? Okay, if you've trusted in him, if you've believed in him, here's the good news. You will never be condemned. You'll be judged, but on that day of judgment... You won't be condemned and sent to hell. Okay, but here's what this is saying. If you haven't believed in him, it's like you're condemned already. It's like you're already under a state of judgment because of your sin. And so the point is, if you were to die right now, there's no do-overs. There's no second chances. Because judgment's coming. And see, this is why the good news is such good news. Because Jesus came, took your place, and is offering you eternal salvation. And my question to you here tonight is, have you believed in him? Have you received the gift that he is offering to you that when he died, you can be forgiven? When he rose, you can have newness of life. Have you trusted in that? Do you know that you've really truly put your faith in Jesus? Do you know that you've been saved? I don't know if you know what today is. Today's date is June 6th. And uh, you might have known it was June 6th. You might not even have known it was June 6th. If you knew it was June 6th, I probably am going to guess that most of you don't know why that's significant. The well, reason why that's significant is because there's a day in our history, June 6th, where something very serious, something very significant happened. You guys know what I'm talking about? On June 6th, Many, many years ago, there was this day that we now know as D-Day. And it was the day, it's often been referred to also as Operation Overlord, where American soldiers stormed the beach of Normandy, and this was a very critical battle in the war that really ultimately led even to the end of the World War. D-Day, you've heard about this, you've learned about this, it was a terrible day. So many people were dying. The beaches of Normandy were just a complete and absolute bloodbath. Could you imagine how sad it would be to be there on that day? Could you imagine how terrible it would be to be there on that day? The sights you would see, the things that you would hear, people crying out in agony and pain, seeing brothers and sisters, people that you fought with, getting taken down left and right beside you as you're storming these beaches. 
Could you imagine being there on that day, being one of those soldiers and getting hit with a bullet, falling down to the ground, and you're in so much pain, you're in so much agony, you're in so much torment, you haven't died yet, but you can just see all of the war going on around you, and then all of a sudden as you're laying there, here comes a medic. And you're thinking to yourself, whoa, salvation, it has come. I I might have a second chance. They might be able to save me. They might be able to fix me. I might be able to get healed. Could you imagine? I mean, we, you can't imagine how ridiculous it would be if on that day while you're laying there thinking your life is over, the medic shows up. He's there to save you. He's there to heal you. And the medic is offering to help you. And you say, nah, <laughs> I'm good. Leave me alone. I don't really, I don't need your help. I mean, like we, we can't, like, right? We, we can't even imagine that. It's obviously a ridiculous scenario. It's obviously something that no, like, no, dude, what are you even talking about? But you get where I'm going with it, right? What this is saying is, if you haven't believed in Jesus, you're dead already. And he's the one who's coming to you, saying, I'm here to save you. I'm here to give you life. All you have to do is receive it. Believe in me. Trust in me. And some of you here tonight, you've heard that message, you know that message, and you want to know what you're doing? No, I'm good. Not me. I don't think I need this. It doesn't make sense. When Jesus is saying, I want to save you. I want to forgive you. I want to give you life. I want you to know that when you are judged, you will not be judged to hell, but you will be judged to heaven. Go back with me to Matthew 25 one last time here tonight, and let me make it clear from this passage how this judgment is going to work. Matthew 25, look at what Jesus says to the sheep that are on his right in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? We never did those things. And the king, Jesus, will answer them in verse 40. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Well, then he says to the goats on his left in verse 42, for I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also answer saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them in verse 45. Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now here's what Jesus is saying, and I want you to write this down for point number three. It's a very simple point. You will be judged based on what you've done. You will be judged based on what you've done. In this moment of evaluation, as he's gathered the nations before him on his throne, he's saying to some on his right, welcome into the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world by my father. Why? Because you loved the brothers. And as you love the brothers, it's like you're loving me. And then to those on his left, the goats, he's saying to them, depart from me. You're going into the fire. You're going into hell. Why? Because you did not love the brothers. And because you did not love the brothers, it's evidence you did not love me. Now, here's what's so important for every single one of us to understand here tonight. This might sound like works-based salvation. Wait, I'm going to be judged based on what I've done? Okay, so I get into heaven if I love people. I go to hell if I don't love people. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus never teaches works-based salvation, but he does teach that works will be the basis of our evaluation. Jesus never, the Bible is so clear. You are not saved by your works. No good works can save you. But on the day of your judgment, you want to know how you're going to be evaluated? By your works. Why? Because works don't save you, but works are evidence of whether or not you've been saved. We're saved by grace through faith. 
We trust in what Jesus has done for us and we receive salvation. But many people say they believe in Jesus and then live in their sin. Those people do not know Jesus. Those who truly believe in Jesus, we will see the fruit and the way that God transforms and changes their life. And specifically, he says here, the way that you will so clearly see it is if you know the love of God, it will show up in the way that you love your brothers and sisters. Go with me to one last passage as we end here tonight and then talk about this for a couple of minutes in our small groups. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and I want you to see this very clearly. This is where Jesus also says this. Matthew chapter 7, look at what he says in verse 17. He says, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, and thus you will recognize them by their fruits. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, when you believe in him for your salvation, God gives you a new heart. He saves you from the inside out. It's like you are now a new person. It's like you're a tree. And those who have been saved, they will produce good fruit. Those who have not been saved, they will produce bad fruit. So how do you know if you've really been saved? Look at your life. What is the fruit on your tree? Is it clear that God has saved you because he's transforming you and making you a new person. Are you still living in your sin? You don't know God. Has God changed you? To now you see love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? Those are the fruits of the Spirit, the evidence that you've got the Spirit and he's changing your life from the inside out. Sad reality is, According to verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, it's like they're saying this on the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, the reason why... You have a key here tonight, and the reason why I hope you go home with it and put it somewhere is because I want this to be a picture that Jesus holds the key for you to see. And the reason why I want this to be a picture that Jesus holds the key is I want you to think about when you stand before him on his throne, and there's a door that's either going to let you into heaven or it's going to be shut and send you to hell. What's Jesus going to do when you're there on that day? Will he unlock the door and let you in? Or will he shut the door, lock it, and say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. Why? Because you're a worker of lawlessness. You don't have good fruit on your tree as evidence that he has saved you and changed you and transformed you. You will be judged by Jesus someday. We don't know when it is. And so the point here tonight is look at your life today. Do you see the fruit of good works? If not, you can trust in Jesus tonight and he will save you and he will transform you and he will make you a new creation, a brand new person. So we've got about 25 minutes to talk about this. And here's what I want to say to you, okay? Small group question is very simple. You can go with your grade. You can go with your group. If you don't know where to go, go with the friend who brought you here tonight. This is the small group question. If works will be the basis for our evaluation on Judgment Day, what kind of fruit are you producing? And here's what I want to say to you here tonight. Some of you guys, you know. Praise God. He saved me, changed me. I know where I will go when I'm judged. Some of you guys, you know what's going to happen. If that's you and you're convicted, and God's opened up your eyes here tonight, what I want to encourage you is when you get with your group, because we only have a couple of minutes, start off right away and say, hey, I got to talk about this. And start that conversation. And even if you want, you and your leader, or you and a friend who brought you here tonight, you can have that conversation, even in a one-on-one kind of a way.